The internet can be a grim place. Surely you don't need someone like me to tell you that. Videos, live streams, works of art, posts, and pages about disturbing events that have happened in our reality are nothing but a Google search away. Underneath the no commentary long plays and the fast lane truck drag race and videos exists a vast ocean of eerie content that'll surely get you thinking. And just mine. Keep you up at nine. Welcome back to Disturbing Things, your one-stop shop for bite-sized, eerie finds that I've recently discovered online. This is episode 12, so if this is your first exposure to this series, be sure to head over to the playlist down below for hours of further content to envelop yourself into. Without further ado, it's time, once again, to dive into five more hand-picked and disturbing things from around the internet. Let's set the mood. On the internet, there exists an album by the name of Everywhere at the End of Time. It was created in 2016 by a musical artist named James Leyland Kirby, also known by his stage name, The Caretaker. While I'm aware that on this show, I primarily cover real world disturbing events, I wanted to discuss this piece of art since it perfectly encapsulates the disturbing reality of over 44 million people that are alive today. As you might have guessed by now, the album's an artistic expression of the numerous stages of dementia and how it slowly overtakes the mind, sending it spiraling into a wormhole of forgetfulness, twisted by a reality that they stray further and further from recognizing. The six-hour album itself starts off ordinary. It's cheery, calm, and invokes a sense of comfort. As the hours pass and it progresses, Leyland subtly morphs not only the overall tone, but each chord progression and tune into something that hardly resembles what you were listening to a mere half hour earlier. The descriptions from his YouTube video further exemplify the troubles that dementia patients face too. Stage one is described as the first signs of memory loss. It's a stage that's most like a beautiful daydream, the glory of old age and recollection, the last of the great days. Stage two encapsulates denial. More efforts made to remember so memories can be more long form with a little more deterioration in quality. The overall personal mood is generally lower than the first stage and at a point before confusion starts setting in. Stage three approaches the metaphorical inflection point. It's described as the phase where some of the last coherent memories exist before confusion fully rolls in and the gray mists form and fade away. Finest moments have been remembered, but the musical flow in places is more confused and tangled. As we progress, some singular memories become more disturbed, isolated, broken, and distant. These are the last embers of awareness before we enter the post-awareness stages. At the two hour and eight minute mark, the album takes a stark tonal shift as it begins to exemplify the post-awareness stages the spot where reality becomes a bleak, confusing mess and where little seems to make sense. It's described as the point where serenity and the ability to recall singular memories gives way to confusions and horror. It's the beginning of an eventual process where all memories begin to become more fluid through entanglements, repetition, and rupture.
Stage 5. More extreme entanglements, repetition, and rupture can give way to calmer moments. The unfamiliar may sound and feel familiar. Time is often spent only in the moment, leading to isolation. In stage six, one without description. I lost my great-grandmother to dementia just a few years ago, so this album really resonated with me. As a child, I remember her being full of life, always willing to go the extra mile to evoke a sense of union and love, whether it was through her cooking, her stories, or even her presence at family gatherings. She was always someone that welcomed us with open arms when we go visit her. She lived alone. My great-grandfather had passed when I was very young, so unfortunately, memories of him are vague but I do remember him as being hardworking and an honest man. Over the years, I didn't fully understand it, but I slowly began to notice that something was off. One year we had gone to visit her and she didn't quite remember myself or my siblings. It's a strange feeling when a family member addresses you with a respectful but off-putting, and you are, line that I'm sure most relatives of dementia patients are accustomed to. And then I realized what it was. Slowly, through subsequent visits, I began to notice things, like sticky notes, explaining basic tasks like remembering to shut off light switches, to close the front door, to turn off the water, how to flush the toilet. Family photos were labeled, and her once lively personality had slowly faded away. She was trying. She was trying so hard to be her. But this condition simply wouldn't let her. Bottom line, everywhere at the end of time is a disturbingly bleak looking glass into the human mind. While it isn't creepy footage or a disturbing phone call, this single piece of art is one of the most real, artistic expressions of a human condition that I've ever encountered. Life is fragile and beautiful, and few things have stuck with me more than this. If you have a story about a friend or relative that you'd like to share, feel free to leave it in a comment while they might have forgotten due to circumstances out of their control, they surely won't be. On the 22nd of May, 2011, a devastating EF5 rated tornado ripped through the city of Joplin, Missouri. It lasted around 38 minutes and reached wind speeds of more or less 200 miles per hour. The aftermath photos are grim. And so too are the videos. For the past couple of years now, I've gotten a few recommendations about covering this upload. And to be honest, I never actually sat down and watched the entire thing all the way through. Life and such just got in the way. But I digress. The video is titled First Person Video of Joplin, Missouri Tornado, created by a user named IzLSG and uploaded on the very same day that this tragedy occurred. Their description claims that they took this footage inside of a fast trip gas station on East 20th Street. Initially, they hid in the back of the store before taking refuge inside of the storage fridge. While there aren't many visuals within their recording, the audio conveys everything you need to know about being caught in a storm of this magnitude. Have a listen. Uh, I uh, at least 
probably 10 or 12. Four, five, six, seven, eight. There's probably 18 or 19. Your chin is getting real. I haven't. Yeah, they said there was one. They said there was one on the ground at Seventh and yes. Range Line. Yeah, but that's the one coming towards us. Mm -hmm. We're on twenty of them. Man, look at that. That's why that wind. That. Yeah. Uh, no, they haven't yet. The sirens aren't going. But yeah, they did. What? Yeah, they Dude. did. That's as we were that's coming crazy. here. This is getting they real. Somebody in. We need it. Get inside that. What is that? Where is it? Yeah, I know. I know. We go in the cooler. Yeah. Come on, guys. Come on. 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 I'm trying to put less weight on him, though. Hey, are you okay? Who's right here? Thankfully, everyone in that store was okay that day. The same, unfortunately, couldn't be said about the others that came face to face with it. In total, the storm took 158 lives and left over 1,100 people injured. Considering the fact that the tornado sirens fired off just 20 minutes before this happened, it's safe to assume that time to escape was minuscule. The incident in Joplin is haunting. And to date, it's cemented into history as the fourth deadliest tornado on record. Hopefully, 10 years later, they've recovered successfully and never, ever have to endure something close to this magnitude ever again. himself by the name of Israel Keys. He was a serial killer, an arsonist, a bank robber, one of the worst types of people that exist. The reason for his suicide was because he was caught after a kidnapping and ransom attempt over 18-year-old Samantha Koenig of Anchorage, Alaska. This is his ransom photo proving that she was alive, to which, in exchange, he had demanded $30,000. Except, in this photo, Samantha Koenig wasn't alive. Let's back up. On the 1st of February, 2012, Koenig was working at a local coffee booth. She can be seen on this CCTV footage where everything seems fine. About two minutes into it, however, we can observe someone approach the window, to which she reacts with unease. 
Afterwards, we can see her hastily shut the lights off before carrying out his demands in the moment. After some back and forth, she opens the register and can be seen taking out cash to give to the man. He then demands that she kneels before he enters through the window. And a few minutes later, he proceeds to escort her out of the trailer. After this moment, she was never seen again. As it turned out, her final moments were grim. Later that night and back at his home, it was reported that he sexually assaulted her, robbed her of everything she had, killed her, and placed her corpse in a shed. Even more bizarrely, the day after, he took off to New Orleans where he went on a two-week cruise with his family. The entire time, she was left there and was never found. Two weeks later, and he comes back from his trip. Her body's still in place, and so Keyes dresses her up with makeup and sews her eyes open for a photo with a recent issue of the local newspaper. He did this to invoke the belief that she was still alive. And like we established prior, he had put a $30,000 price tag on her. While this facade was happening, in reality, he had dumped her body in Matanuska Lake, a few miles north of Anchorage. Israel Keys was later caught. However, it wasn't where you'd expect. As it turned out, he'd taken off towards the mainland US, utilizing Koenig's bank card for cash withdrawals as if nothing happened. Because of this, Police were able to follow his trail and eventually tracked him down to a Cotton Patch Cafe in Lufkin, Texas. It was the morning of March 12th when Texas Ranger Stephen Rayburn would perform the arrest and afterwards, Keyes was promptly sent back to Alaska where he eventually confessed to not only this act, but numerous others. By December of that year though, he would be found dead in his jail cell. He had slit his wrists and tried to strangle himself leave him behind his own corpse and various notes and drawings made in blood under his cell bed. To this day, police are still frustrated by this as with his life went countless questions unanswered. Samantha Koenig was just an ordinary person working her job as we all do. She didn't sign up for this, she didn't provoke anyone, and she sure as hell didn't deserve the faith that she was given. What she thought would be just another night at work had devolved into a surreal night of hell. A night of hell that led to an injustice. And, frustratingly, there's nothing that anyone can do to ever bring her back. On August 28th of 2009, a California Highway Patrol officer named Mark Saylor was on a drive in a Lexus sedan with his wife Cleofe, brother-in-law Chris, and daughter Mahala. They were heading northbound on California State Route 125 towards Mission Gorge Road in Santee. While the circumstances outlined appeared to be ordinary, little did they know that their vehicle would lead to this venture being their last. At around 7 p.m., a phone call was made to 911. It was from Chris, and he could be heard pleading for help since his car had malfunctioned. Have a listen. Oh. 911 emergency, what are you reporting? Yeah, we're in a, we're in a I'm, I'm sorry, your cell phone's cutting out. We're going north 125. Mm-hmm. And I'm still stuck. I'm sorry? Our accelerator stuck. We're on 125 or we're late. Okay, northbound 125, where are you passing? We are passing, uh, where are we passing? We're, we're, we're going 120, Mission Gorge. We're in, we're in trouble. We can't, well, there's no brakes. Okay. Mission Gorge, in freeway, half mile. Okay, and you don't have the ability to, like, turn the vehicle off or anything? We're, we're approaching the intersection. We're approaching the intersection. Okay. Uh, 
We're approaching intersection. Hold on. First tonight, we are hearing from the attorneys for both Bob Baker Lexus and the family of Officer Mark Saylor, who was killed along with his family in a fiery crash one year ago in Santee. Today, Toyota announced it had settled the lawsuit with the Saylor family, but 10 News has learned it has. As a result of this, everyone in that car lost their lives that night. The worst part about it is that the car wasn't even theirs. It was a loaner given to them by a nearby Lexus dealership. It was reported that the vehicle had reached a top speed of 120 miles per hour before crashing into a Ford Explorer and jumping off an embankment near the Mission Gorge Road intersection at the end of Highway 125. Witnesses claimed that the vehicle was thrown nearly 100 feet into the air before crashing into the ground and bursting into flames. After the incident, it was reported that the Explorer driver had suffered minor injuries and was promptly treated at a nearby hospital. For the family, it was believed that the accelerator had become stuck due to an engineering oversight in Lexus models that included rubber floor mats. After a myriad of other incidents related to this, Lexus eventually rolled out numerous recalls from the span of 2009 to 2011, most of which being related to the accelerator pedal. The sheer amount of issues in affected vehicles are staggering too. On your screen is a list of the recalls they'd sent out, and as you can see, a ton of them are related to the brakes or the accelerator pedal. By the end of it, over 5.2 million vehicles were affected, and in hindsight, it's safe to say that anyone driving a Lexus model from 2009 to 2011 were rightfully on edge. The families of the victims eventually filed numerous lawsuits against Toyota, and as a result, they eventually came to a $10 million settlement. No matter how you slice it though, no amount of money can bring someone back from a design failure that they had no control over. They didn't deserve to die that day, and his final 911 call will forever remain cemented into internet history as one of the most disturbing real-world examples of a simple weekend drive that shouldn't have ended the way it had. At 7.23 a.m. on the morning of September 29th of 2016, Pasacac Valley Line train 1614 departs the Spring Valley Station in New York, heading southbound for the Hoboken Station in New Jersey. One way, the trip takes about an hour by train, and on board that morning were an estimated 250 passengers. The ride itself is mostly okay, with nothing seeming awry. Time begins to pass, and train goers await the day of work ahead of them. Eight forty five AM. The train's approaching its destination. Being one of the busiest travel hubs in the region, Hoboken Station was lively as expected. The train approaches the terminal, and where it's typically required to stop, it doesn't. It maintains its full speed and crashes through the buffer stop at the end of the rail, causing passengers to be thrown throughout the cabin and forced into a manic frenzy with no clue on how to process it. We just kept going and going, no braking, no nothing, Jamie Weatherhead Saul claims. The moment feels like an eternity, at least until gravity does what it does. The train comes to a halt past the rails and up against the terminal wall and the normally busy and lively train station is now temporarily declared a disaster area. On this day, 114 passengers are injured and one loses their life. September 29th is now forever associated with a tragedy that should not have happened.
While this event is tragic in and of itself, on the internet and through word of mouth, the mystery surrounding it is merely beginning to take root. Let's back up. Good morning from the wires of Associated Press and the WKT. It's one day prior, the 28th. A central New York TV station named WKTV was broadcast on the usual 6 p.m. lineup. During a commercial break, however, something peculiar would overtake their station. Let's have a look. Civil authorities have issued a hazardous materials warning for the United States, effective until September 29th, 2.16 a.m. Would you, could you, on a train? Interesting. Not only did they appear to be hacked, but of all things, it referenced a Dr. Seuss quote about a train. And the timing is striking. Immediately after, WKTV puts out numerous statements from their Twitter. If you were watching our 6 p.m. newscast, you saw a hazardous materials warning message. There is no such warning. It was a technical error. And later that night from their website. If you were watching our newscast around 6.17 p.m. or at 10.38 p.m., you may have seen a hazardous materials warning crawl across your screen. There is no such warning. The message was an automated test which was not intended for public display. This message originated from FEMA as a test and had the national location code in it. Tests should not have that code as it's automatically retransmitted. We have contacted the New York State Broadcasters Association who administers the emergency alert system in New York. We're working with FEMA to resolve this. Our apologies for the confusion this may have caused. In total, there wasn't one, but two of these alerts. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to find footage of them separately. However, it's safe to assume that they were either the exact same or very similar. Interestingly, if we pick apart their wording, WKTV is mostly pinning the blame on FEMA, the Government Disaster Relief Program. An interesting claim, but perhaps that's all it was. One day later, and the train crash occurs. WKTV releases yet another statement containing an update. FEMA replied that they did not send this out. They'll launch a full investigation into how their codes were hacked. WKTV seems to be the only target of this hack. For now, we've disabled the codes in our decoder that trigger this alert. If there's a real national alert, we'll still receive it from the local radio stations we're assigned to monitor. WKTV will cooperate fully with FEMA, providing information about our hardware, software, and internet access, and will provide log files from our devices. This information will be helpful to FEMA to track down the source of this hack. Oddly, around the same time that this was happening, other videos began to crop up, showing strange alerts that had happened in places around the United States. While these are indeed strange, and do hint at the possibility of a system-wide hack, the incident that occurred on WKTV was the only one of its kind to include this unusual Dr. Seuss quote. Unfortunately though, to this day, the origin and motive of why this happened, or who did it, has remained unsolved. Of all the entries I've covered thus far on disturbing things, this is one of the most bewildering. Understandably, since this occurred, conspiracy theories have cropped up all over the internet 
theorizing on the potential of the train operator being complicit and entertaining the idea that the crash was somehow planned by some external party. While I personally don't subscribe to these, what I do find highly unusual is the timing, and I don't think I'll ever be able to shake that. An audible simulation, Mother Nature's wrath, a nightmarish abduction, a disturbing plea for help, and an eerie broadcast alert. The world can be a depressing, creepy, and disturbing place, and tonight's topics encapsulate the world. It's the 23rd of February, 2017. A criminal trespassing incident occurs in Billings Heights, Montana. Case number 17.12420. The local police department takes to Facebook soon after to ask for the public's help in tracking down this mysterious individual that, considering what he'd done, is every parent's worst nightmare. The Billings Police Department is asking for the public to be aware of an incident that took place last week in the Billings Heights. On the above date and time, officers responded to a possible burglary in progress. The female resident reported to officers as she observed a male subject in her infant daughter's bedroom on the baby monitor. The victim said she immediately went to her daughter's bedroom, removed her daughter, and left the residence. When officers arrived, the residence and neighborhood were searched, but the suspect was not located. The victim said that the baby monitor is synced to her cell phone. The baby monitor is motion activated and took the attached photo of the suspect, which alerted her cell phone. And that photo is this one. To date, this mysterious intruder has never been found. The world can be a depressing, creepy, and disturbing place, and tonight's topics encapsulated that. You and I just dove into six disturbing things from around the internet. I hope you all enjoyed this, and if you have any further submissions for this series, feel free to submit them to the show's inbox at dtfaisubmissions at gmail.com. Thank you all for watching. I'll see you soon. I love you all. Good night.